Hi friends, thanks so much for joining us tonight as we continue this semester's faculty seminars through the Soren Fellows Program. Rooted in the scholarly ethos of the De Nicola Center, these monthly seminars, facilitated by the most exceptional faculty at Notre Dame and beyond, are intended to engage and inform you, our Soren Fellows, about enduring and contemporary topics surrounding and informed by the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition. The inspiration for this event is twofold. First, we anticipate that your educational experience at Notre Dame, St. Mary's College, or Holy Cross College will be rigorous and nourishing, no matter if you are an undergraduate, graduate, or professional student. However, we believe there are some things so important to an authentically Catholic educational experience that every student, no matter their course of study or professional goals, should not only be exposed to them, but also have a familiarity and appreciation of them, be it with respect to public bioethics, education policy, St. Thomas Aquinas, and more. Now at the same time, and in the interdisciplinary spirit of the center, we recognize that the requirements of your degree program may preclude you from dedicating a semester to the study of these enduring themes or contemporary issues through a class or even several classes. Leveraging the center's robust network of excellent faculty on campus and beyond, these faculty seminars are formulated in an effort to allow you the opportunity to build an introductory familiarity, as well as to chart a course forward with the topic through additional resources. Again, like most of our programming this semester, these seminars would best take place in person in a classroom in DBART, OSHAG, or the law school, which we plan on moving forward once our shared life together regains some normalcy. But in the interim, we will host these over Zoom, which will allow you to access and revisit this content at your own leisure, whether in your dorm room or on a walk around campus. The format of these conversations will be as follows. Our guest will lecture for about 30 minutes, providing a high level but substantive treatment of the seminar's topic. Then we'll be joined live via Zoom webinar by our guest so he or she can field questions from Soren Fellows that arose out of the seminar. And that will run for about 20 minutes or so. With that said, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our guest this evening. John O'Callaghan is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Jacques Maritain Center here at Notre Dame. Not to be outdone, he also serves as a, as a Senior Advisor and Faculty Fellow at the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. Professor O'Callaghan is one of the world's leading scholars on Thomas Aquinas. His areas of scholarly interest include medieval philosophy, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, and Thomistic metaphysics and ethics. He teaches courses both in the undergraduate and graduate levels here at Notre Dame, all of which I would highly, highly recommend. Professor O'Callaghan is a permanent member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, having been appointed to that distinguished post in 2010 by Pope Benedict XVI. He has also served as the president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association. Professor O'Callaghan earned his Bachelor's of Science degree from St. Norbert College and his Master's of Science and his PhD in Philosophy here from Notre Dame, where he studied under the legendary Catholic philosopher, author, and professor Ralph McInerney. A frequent contributor to Soren Fellows programming, Professor O'Callaghan and his wife Mary have hosted several supper clubs and reading groups in their home. And just last year, Professor O'Callaghan hosted a film discussion on Terence Malick's A Hidden Life. For the many of you who have enjoyed their company over dinner or the like, I hope this lecture and question and answer serves as an opportunity to continue the lively conversation. Okay, so uh, I've been asked to talk about three things uh, that you ought to know uh, about Thomas Aquinas. Um, and I've been offered, I think, $2 for doing that, so I hope I earn the $2 uh, and that I get the $2 because uh, because we're a kind of cheap outfit around here. But uh, in any case, I thought I'd start with pointing out that Thomas Aquinas wrote something like 8 million words in 25 years. That works out to about 27,000 pages of double-spaced text or roughly 150-page um, books, about 180 books. So um, that's one thing to know about Thomas Aquinas. Another was that he is reputed to have been enormous extraordinarily large human being, 
But now you have to consider how big a person was in the Middle Ages. So I oftentimes think that in fact he wasn't that big. Um, he was just, I was probably bigger than Thomas Aquinas was, so they would have to break my bones as they did with him to get him out of the place he died in. And then the third thing that you need to know is that um, his brothers, trying to get him to leave the Dominican order, uh, kidnapped him and put him in a tower for a year, and in the midst of that, they uh, introduced a prostitute into his room to see if he would break his vows. And he grabbed a fire iron from the fire and he chased the woman out of his room, closed the door, and made a sign of the cross on the door with the fire iron, uh, thereby exhibiting the one moment in his life that he is known to have been angry. So that's three things that you need to know about Thomas Aquinas, and I think we can call it quits now, and I want my two dollars. Uh, I'm looking over, you don't realize that Pete is over in the corner and he's shaking his head no. So it seems as though I have to do a little bit more to earn my money, my two dollars. Great John Cusack film, by the way. Better off dead. I want my two dollars. So, a little bit more seriously here, um, what you want to know about Aquinas in general is that he's part of a long history in the life of the church of trying to engage secular learning. This goes back to the first, uh, second, first and second centuries of the life of the church, in particular in a figure named Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr had said, had been trained as a philosopher, and he converted to Christianity. And he basically said um, to himself, well, how should I think about philosophy, the philosophy I learned, because he valued it. And he came up with a kind of way of thinking of philosophy as a preparation for the gospel. And he basically said, um, these philosophers, they lead you to God. But of course the point is, uh, God comes to us. God comes to us in Revelation, and God comes to us uh, most fully in Jesus Christ. And so you have this long tradition of trying to think through what it is that philosophy achieves and what it is we get in Revelation. And Thomas Aquinas joins that uh, in his life. And the way he joins that is essentially he thinks of philosophy as um, asking natural human questions about happiness, uh, where we are destined to go, where we came from, where we're going, how do we get there. And that's what he sees going on in the philosophers, philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics. They're all asking, how should I live? Philosophy wasn't a kind of armchair, sit around, talk um, BS to one another um, kind of activity. It was, how can I live a good life? What do I need to know? What's the nature of wisdom? And Plato had said that wisdom is the knowledge of the highest causes of things that allows you to put order in your own life and the life of the world around you. So you see it as a kind of practice. Well, so Thomas looks at that tradition and he says, well, what we get in Revelation is God coming to us as wisdom and in a way answering the questions that arise out of human life um, quite naturally. The evidence for them arising out of human life naturally is the life of the philosophers, the ancient philosophers. Um, but he famously says that what the philosophers have achieved is not a whole lot, especially with respect to God as our final and ultimate end. Uh, they do achieve some things, but they don't achieve an awful lot, takes an awful long time, and probably there's uh, an admixture of error, especially when you consider all the different philosophical schools. So Thomas essentially says uh, that God in his mercy, wanting us to know that um, our end is to know and love God, God in his mercy comes to us rather than waiting for us to achieve something by going to God. So God comes to us, God uh, reveals uh, himself in, uh, to the Jews uh, through scripture, and then that culminates in the incarnation of Christ. That's the basic picture that Thomas has, God coming to us as an act of mercy. And so that's, a, that's sort of the general uh, point I want to make, and then I want to make three points about that. So technically I'm going to give you four things. So I should really get three dollars, not two dollars. So the first thing I want to do is say something about what Thomas has to say about faith. As I say, in eight million words, there's really too much to pick from in terms of things that you could know about Aquinas that he does and does really well. But um, the first thing I want to point out is specifically important for us, 
in uh, the world today because he's not a mere historical figure. He's a figure that we need to take seriously for our own lives as providing guidance to us, despite the difference between the 13th century when he lived and the 21st century when we live. So the first thing I want to point out is what he has to say about faith. Now, the way we tend to talk about faith is we sort of draw a dichotomy between faith and reason. And um, we say, well, can faith coexist with reason? And there are an awful lot of people who would say, no, faith is unreasonable, it's irrational, at best it's non-rational. And then we say, typically, oh, no, 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 um, faith can coexist with reason. Even at a Catholic university like Notre Dame, when they talk about the mission, right, a place where faith and reason can coexist and live together. But in a way, that's already giving away the game because it's already separating faith and reason into these two things and then asking how they relate, right? And so the, those who would say, well, faith is unreasonable or at best non-rational, they've already won the game. You've already given it away by basically saying, yes, the groundwork is as you say, it's just that we can live here peacefully. Well, the way Aquinas thinks about faith, Aquinas thinks faith is an activity of the intellect. Oftentimes we think, well, faith is about the will, a choice of the will. The will is involved in faith for Aquinas, but um, faith itself is the activity of the intellect trying to understand what has been revealed in Scripture and in Christ. So it's a kind of knowledge. What he says is that kind of faith, that kind of knowledge, um, is not the sort of knowledge that you get in a kind of demonstration. And he meant something very strong by demonstration. But if you had Descartes, for instance, or if you are familiar with Descartes, you could think of mathematical demonstration. Right? Descartes famously said, you know, you shouldn't hold as true. In fact, you should hold as false anything that you yourself cannot prove to be true on the basis of demonstration modeled after mathematical demonstration. Well, think about the things you couldn't claim to know. Right? You couldn't claim to know who your father is because certainly that's not a matter of mathematical demonstration. It's easily doubted. Right? The easiest thing to doubt is what other people have told you. So um, faith is sort of excluded in that context. What Thomas wants to say is, well, faith actually is a kind of knowledge, uh, but it's not a knowledge that you get through a demonstration. There are things you can demonstrate to be true, and faith in that respect falls short of demonstration. On the other hand, um, he says that faith has a kind of certitude to it in the intellect, and it's an ascent of the intellect because of the one who is telling you about it. This is why you can claim to know who your father is, right? Because it's your mother who says so, and she's trustworthy, and she loves you, and you love her. None of that is unreasonable. Listening to people who love you is not unreasonable, and it allows you to know things you otherwise wouldn't know. It enables your knowledge. It doesn't compete with your knowledge. It's not something other than your knowledge. It enables your knowledge. So in the case of religious faith, I mean, that's natural faith. Who's my father? Well, ask my mother. She's the only one that genuinely knows, right? Um, so uh, even his knowing that he's my father is based upon his faith in her and their fidelity to one another and faithfulness. So faith enables knowledge. But Thomas does think that it requires an act of the will, that the will makes the intellect assent to what cannot be finally demonstrated. Well, but the will for Thomas is the seat of love. And so saying that the will moves the intellect to faith, and faith being knowledge on the basis of that movement of the will, well, for Thomas, that means that faith also involves love. Love of the one that you believe in faith. And then through that faith, he says, you can direct your um, will to God as your end. Right? So you think of um, the difference between saying, I believe you, I believe that you are, say, from Wisconsin, and from Green Bay. Right? Why do I believe that? Well, because I believe you. But then there's another thing where you might say, and I direct myself to you as the object of my love. Okay? Um, spousal relations are good are a good example there right you believe that she loves you because she says so 
and you believe the things she tells you and reveals about herself to you because she says so. And then you direct your love to her, your will to her as your end. Well, that's what Thomas thinks happens in uh, faith. It's a kind of knowledge based upon God revealing. So you believe God. You believe what God says about God, that God is good, that God is just, that God is merciful. And because of that, you can direct your will to God as your end, your end being a knowing and loving union with God, and then also with your neighbor in God. Finally, what does God reveal about knowing and loving your neighbor in God? Well, what Thomas thinks that means is you need to love your neighbor as God loves your neighbor. You need to love yourself as God loves you, not as you would love yourself apart from God, but as God loves you. And how do you know that? How do you have the knowledge of what it is for God to love you? It's revealed in Scripture and in the life of Christ. So that's the first point. Right? It's important to know that for Thomas, faith is knowledge. It's not unreasonable or non-reasonable. It makes knowledge possible. You go into a physics class, you got to listen to the teacher if you're going to learn physics. He enables you to learn physics, and God enables you to love God by revealing himself through Scripture and Revelation. Okay, so, second point. This is the importance of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. This is a point made by a German philosopher named Joseph Pieper. He calls it the silent element in Aquinas. And what he means by that is that the doctrine of creation is essentially behind everything that Thomas Aquinas says. Even when he's not talking about creation, that's uh, what animates his thought. And, and, and you understand his thought better on a particular topic by um, understanding that creation is in the background. So very quickly, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is that God is responsible for the existence of all things and in any way they exist other than God. Anything that other than God that exists, God is responsible for its existence at every moment of, of its existence. So the worms in the ground, the oak trees, the dirt, this uh, podium, the universe as a whole, God is responsible for its existence at every moment of its existence. And it's important to recognize it's not making. So when we talk about making stuff, we presuppose something and then we form it into something new. But we're not responsible for the stuff that we form into something new. We presuppose that, and that's what it is to make something. So Thomas doesn't think that God makes anything because he doesn't presuppose anything. That's the notion of creatio ex nihilo. It's a doctrine that developed in the life of the church in the first few centuries as a way of understanding the almightiness of God against a kind of Gnosticism that would see a kind of uncreated principle in competition with God. No, all things that exist whatsoever exists in any way that it exists at any time that it exists is caused to be by God. And that's a kind of reflection on Genesis and an effort to understand the goodness of creation. So the goodness of creation for Thomas um, is at the heart of the way in which he thinks about our need to understand creation. Revelation is made to us in words, words that are understood on the basis of what we know about the world. So knowing the world helps us to understand what is revealed. But that's because the world itself is, in a way, divine language spoken to us. Apart from Revelation, and Revelation relies upon that knowledge of the world that God has made. This is why Thomas very famously says that there can be no conflict between what we know of the world apart from Revelation and what we know of the world in virtue of Revelation, because God is the source of both, as revealing and as creating. Okay? So creation, again, is this um, aspect of his thought that um, helps you to understand pretty much everything he says. And one feature of God being a creator is that God must, God must utterly transcend the universe. And in that respect, not be like anything in the universe. Everything that exists in the universe is a kind of finite and limited imitation of God. But God is not like the universe. We, according to Genesis, are made to the image and likeness of God. It doesn't follow from that that God is like us. Because in God's transcendence, 
If God is responsible for the existence of all things other than God, and doesn't presuppose anything that God acts upon, then God can't be like anything. Utterly transcendent in that respect. Well, what, now, why is that important? Well, because it kind of makes you realize what a mystery the Incarnation is. Because what happens in the Incarnation? This utterly transcendent being, that's three persons, one divine substance, becomes like us in the second person. Christ is both God, fully God, and fully human. But how can that be? He be God becomes like us in Christ. But if we think that God is just like us already, that's not particularly mysterious, and it's not particularly spectacular. Right? If God is just like me, what's the big deal that he's born of a woman? Right? Mary is the God-bearer, the Theotokos or the Theotokos, depending on who you talk to. Um, so she's the mother of God. How can that be? How can someone mother God? Well, if God is just like me, Right? Just maybe a little stronger, a little more powerful, maybe an ubermensch, a superman. Well, you know, okay, so she's gave birth to Superman. No. Right? Mary gave birth to God in Jesus Christ. And that's extraordinarily mysterious. And in a sense will never be fully understood, except perhaps in Beatitude when we learn something more about it. But it's not particularly mysterious if you don't understand God as creator. And if you think God is just sort of the biggest thing around, the biggest thing on the block, and just like you, then Nietzsche and um, Freud are right in the 19th century when they say basically the image of God that we have is an image of ourselves made perfect. So we have made God in our own image. No, scripture says we are made to the image and likeness of God, but God is not like us. So that doctrine of creation. The third point I want to make is about mercy and Thomas Aquinas on mercy. I have a friend who likes to call me One Note O'Callaghan because I always talk about mercy in Aquinas. Well, I think um, today I can say I've got three notes, right? Faith, creation, and mercy. However, mercy is um, itself um, an act of creation. And this is this extraordinary claim that Aquinas makes. First, when he talks about mercy, misericordia, remember, salve regina, mater misericordiae, um, hail queen, mother of mercy, Mary mothers mercy, but it's Christ who is the mercy that she mothers. Okay. Well, uh, mercy, as Thomas understands it, he says it's a kind of heartfelt compassion within us um, that um, we adopt, we adopt the suffering of another in that compassion. That's what compassion means, to suffer with. So we adopt the suffering of another, and then we act to the extent that we can to alleviate it. Well, that actually looks like what the philosophers said about friendship, except that friendship, they didn't really talk about compassion. Okay? What Aristotle says about friendship, the highest form of friendship, is that you make the good of the other your own. That's friendship. You make their good your own. You don't project your good onto them. You recognize what's good for them, and then you pursue that. Right? So you lose in a chess tournament, but your best friend um, wins the uh, chess tournament, and you rejoice over his victory. Right? You've made his good your own, because you lost. You're a loser. Right? But you're a winner in him because you have made his victory your own, but precisely as his victory. Not your victory, his victory is what you rejoice in. Well, what Thomas is saying about misericordia is it's a kind of friendship. But what he wants to say is, well, Aristotle is in a way partially right. You make the good of the other your own in friendship. But you can't actually do that unless you're willing to make their suffering your own as well. And so that's what mercy is, to make the suffering of another your own and then to act um, to alleviate it. Well, that poses a problem for attributing mercy to God, this creator God. Because this creator God can't suffer. Right? It's not like this creator God can have an absence or a lack. This creator God has to be, in a way, the fullness of existence and being. Whereas a lack is an absence of being. So this creator God can't have a passion, can't suffer 
as a result of the observation of the suffering of another. Okay. And Thomas will grant that. That's an objection that he deals with. And he says, well, yeah, considering God simply as God, God cannot suffer. But he says you can attribute mercy to God because God can achieve the effects of mercy or misericordia, and that is to alleviate suffering. So alleviating suffering, God can be said to be merciful, but we have to leave out this aspect of uh, passion, of being affected, right? Well, that can be sound very dissatisfying. Well, what motivates um, the um, acting to alleviate suffering is God's love. And Thomas makes another very odd claim about God's mercy. One of the questions he asks is, is God's mercy found in all of God's acts? And an objection that um, uh, he has to deal with is, well, no, it can't be found in all of God's acts because it can't be found in creation. Why can't it be found in creation? Well, uh, mercy presupposes suffering. But if God is the creator of all things other than himself, ex nihilo, there's nothing that's suffering, that then God alleviates that suffering by his merciful act. Well, uh, this looks like a pretty tough objection. But what Thomas does is something he rarely does. And he explicitly contradicts himself, if you um, consider it literally. Because when he's talking about creation, he says it's a mistake to think of creation as if non-being is like this soup of nothingness. And there are things in a kind of quasi-existence in non-being. And God draws things out of non-existence um, in creating them. So they have a kind of prior non-existent existence. And Thomas thinks that's just ushwa, if I can say that on, on film. Um, so Thomas just thinks that's ridiculous. Uh, and it's incoherent. But when he's dealing with this objection, he says, well, you can think of non-existence as a kind of suffering. So, as I say, in that respect, if you were to say, well, if you're speaking literally, Thomas, you've just contradicted yourself, and how could he contradict himself? And I usually tell people, when you find Thomas doing that, um, it's easy to think that people are idiots and that's why they contradict themselves. It's hard to think that Thomas Aquinas is an idiot if you spend any time reading him and doesn't know what he's doing. So what you want to do when it looks like Thomas Aquinas contradicts himself is say, why did he do that? Well, my thought is the reason he does that is he's using a metaphor to communicate a truth. We don't think you can use metaphors to communicate truth. In the pre-modern period, they thought metaphors are sometimes the best things for communicating truth. Okay? So um, if I use a metaphor now in a statement, you'll say, oh, that's not literally true. Well, Thomas thought you make literally true statements using images all the time. And you could try to go the day without using a metaphor in the things you're trying to say about the world. And if you become conscious of it, you realize how hard it is to speak literally without metaphors and images. So Thomas is using an image there. And you want to say, well, what's the image supposed to communicate? He's not contradicting himself, but he's using this image to um, make a point. And what is that point? Well, the point is that in creation, God puts things into being, and by doing so, brings them to himself. Right? You are brought to God by mercy. Um, and you are drawn to him by mercy. That's again going back to this idea that your destiny and your end is a loving, knowing union with God. So Thomas will say all things are drawn to God by creation and their destiny um, is in God. Ours is a knowing, loving union with God. So in this act of divine mercy, which is creation, Thomas will say that's the first effect of divine mercy. The ultimate effect of divine mercy is beatitude, when we become one with God and retain our identity, but nonetheless have a kind of union with God through our intellects and our wills uh, that, he'll say, suffuses through the rest of our bodies. We rejoice throughout our entire life and in our bodies because of what's happening with respect to this union. Okay, so we're still talking about God, right, and that God can't suffer okay, as God. 
And the first act of creation is an act of mercy, okay? drawing us to God. But how does God achieve that? Well, here Thomas would point out that, well, Jesus wept. Why is that significant? Jesus weeps. It's the um, shortest verse in the Bible if you play Trivial Pursuit. Um, you'll always win if you know that Jesus wept. So he weeps before he raises Lazarus from the dead. He suffers with Lazarus and his sisters and their friends. The people around say, see how much he loved them when he weeps. Well, we have the Incarnation. I mentioned that the doctrine of creation reinstills the doctrine of the Incarnation with a kind of mystery to it. What happens in the Incarnation? In the Incarnation, we have God coming to us. So I said, in creation, the idea is it's merciful because God draws us to him through creation. But in the Incarnation, God comes to us in Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made, and nothing was made without him. And he came and he pitched his tent amongst us. So God comes to us. Out of what? Out of love for us. And what's the result of God coming to us? Out of love for us. The passion of Christ. So God suffers. God has a passion in Christ. He has a passion because he makes himself like us. We are like him through creation. He is like us through the Incarnation. And through that Incarnation, he suffers with us because he has made our suffering his own. God so loved the world that he sent his only Son. In the NFL, you used to be able to see that sign hanging on the side of the uh, stand. Somebody would always have it at John 3, uh, John 3.16. And uh, I finally once looked it up, and that, that's what it said. God so loved the world. So the ultimate act of divine mercy, the effect of divine mercy, its first effect is creation. Its ultimate effect is the incarnation, where God suffers with us. And so you can say that God suffers. Once you understand what you mean, God suffers with us in Christ and acts to alleviate our suffering, overcoming death. So mercy is in the beginning and in the end. Mercy is the Alpha and the Omega. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made, and nothing was made without him. And he came and he pitched his tent amongst us. What is the word of God? The word of God is mercy. Thank you. So um, I thought I'd recommend uh, for your edification uh, a few books. Um, I mentioned The Silence of St. Thomas. That's a book by Joseph Pieper. Um, and Joseph Pieper, if you, can, if you ever see in bookstores anything by Joseph Pieper, buy it. Uh, he's German. Uh, he's now deceased. May he rest in peace. Uh, but he's the clearest German writer you will ever read, both in English and in German. Um, extraordinarily clear. And I think of all 20th century Thomas, perhaps the most perceptive um, about what's taking place in Thomas. I mean, uh, I've known many Thomas. My director was a wonderful Thomas and a great Thomas, uh, Ralph McInerney, and anything by him, read that. Uh, but Pieper has this ability to sort of, in a straightforward way, just communicate the heart of what's going on. So one book is um, the uh, Guide to Thomas Aquinas. Right. Um, this is about 20 years old, but I think this is still in print. Um, this is just a general overview, and it's a very good general overview of Aquinas. I would not recommend trying to um, read Thomas Aquinas cold, right? I tried that when I was 18, and I did it for about half an hour, and I said, what the hell? Um, so, and then I went off and I became a physics major and an engineer, right, because of that experience of trying to read Thomas Aquinas. Um, I'm better at it now. Uh, so, uh, this guide to Thomas Aquinas, um, I know that the Center for Ethics and Culture probably wants me to mention uh, Professor Sneed's book, um, What It Means to Be Human, but I'm not going to mention it. 
right? Because that's Mr. Hellenius's job, and he'll make sure that you know about it. Um, check your spam filter. So I'm not going to mention that book. Um, I will mention, as I said, The Silence of St. Thomas. This is St. Augustine Press. This is St. Ignatius Press. The Silence of St. Thomas. It's only about oh, 70 pages long, and it's about the best thing you're ever going to read about Thomas Aquinas. And this is where he talks about uh, creation and the importance of creation. Um, happiness and contemplation. Uh, when uh, about 50 years ago, Notre Dame used to require all incoming freshmen to write an essay on a book by Pieper called Leisure, The Basis of Culture. That's a good book. This is an excellent book, right? So read this. This is about um, what it means to be human. And it really puts um, the sorts of things that we do in perspective. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, in it is, um, what is it we're supposed to do when we've fed everybody and we've clothed everybody and we've made sure everybody has a home? Now, unfortunately, in this world, that's never going to happen. But think like a philosopher. Suppose it did happen. What then? Do we then just abandon one another and go off on our own lives, sol having solved all problems like that? And what this book is about is trying to help you understand, no, there's a purpose to that, and that is to live in friendship with one another and with God. So happiness and contemplation. Just an outstanding book. And I said three books, but I'm going to give you a fourth. Um, again, now I get $4. Um, this isn't about Aquinas. This is about Plato. Um, it's called Enthusiasm and Divine Madness on the Platonic Dialogue Phaedrus. You don't have to read the Platonic Dialogue Phaedrus. Read this book. I mean, read the Phaedrus if you want to. But read this book. This is just a marvelous book about um, divine madness. Right? Um, the idea that um, God isn't this kind of static thing, right? Um, that there's a kind of um, madness to divinity. And that, that, that Plato grasps that. And of course, Pieper's point would be something like what we saw in Justin Martyr and Aquinas, and that is what comes to us in uh, Revelation is that madness comes to us. Not madness in the sense of anger, but madness in the sense of love. That there's a kind of madness to love. Um, you go insane right, when you fall in love. And that's what this book is about, and it's just an absolutely marvelous book. Not about Aquinas, about Plato. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, friends, for joining us tonight. I know it's a busy time of the semester, um, so thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your evening um, for this awesome faculty seminar with Professor O'Callaghan. And Professor O'Callaghan, thank you for joining us this evening to uh, take part in a little bit of a live question and answer. We have had some questions come in from our Soren fellows, so I'll get right into it to make the most out of the next 15 minutes or so. Sure. Awesome. All right. First one that came in. So could you uh, speak a little bit more to how Aquinas understands the relationship between faith and reason? A comment here. It's common in popular Catholic discourse to hear about the complementarity of faith and reason or the coexistence of faith and reason, especially through the work of, of John Paul II, for example. Is it accurate to suggest that you're cautioning and Aquinas is cautioning against bifurcating the two into neat and tidy categories? And then, like, what difference does it make when we embrace the fullness of how Thomas des describes this relationship between faith and reason? Yeah, um, I certainly am cautioning against a kind of bifurcating of these things. I mean, there's a complicated uh, history whereby we've come to think of it in those terms. Um, especially, um, I want to be a little bit careful with regard to saying something about um, St. John Paul II whom I loved and was just overwhelmed when he um, wrote his encyclical Fides et Ratio, uh, where he, uh, um, he investigates this. What he's doing there, and I think it's somewhat legitimate, is trying to engage the contemporary discussion. He doesn't, uh, for the purpose of that engagement, um, fundamentally challenge that. I think he would ultimately, but I think for the purpose of the engagement, he wanted to say, well, there's a kind of notion of reason which we accept as distinct from faith. And um, that animates an awful lot of the discussion. 
And so he's trying to bring them more closely together. So what I would say about him, for instance, is that he's not accepting the groundwork the way in which I put it, right? That they just kind of coexist. He has this marvelous image of the two wings of a dove, right? Um, and they both give rise to the flight of the dove. And um, so in his case, I would say, he's just trying to engage a secular world that sees this dichotomy and he's trying to push them together. But I think, um, I think he would acknowledge and, and not just acknowledge because he's a much more brilliant thinker than I am, um, that it's unfortunate that we have to kind of do that. Um, Pascal says, um, the heart has reasons that reason does not know. Now, when people talk like, about Pascal, they sort of put that in terms of, oh, what he's talking about are the emotions, right? So that faith becomes a kind of, if you associate faith with the heart, right? That faith becomes a kind of emotional thing. Um, and, and emotional people are faithful and so on and so on. But he's really pointing out the difference between a kind of scientific rationality, which is perfectly appropriate in the um, uh, world of the sciences, and that rationality has other forms than purely scientific rationality, where you do sort of say, well, I've got tons of reasons for loving my wife, right? I've got tons of reasons for having the friends I have. Um, I've got really good reasons for most of the things I do um, on a daily basis, if I'm living well, that aren't accountable on the basis of scientific rationality. And the point there is to say, well, scientific rationality isn't the only kind of rationality there is, but that's what people tend to think of when they think of faith and reason. An awful lot of the philosophical context in contemporary discussion is kind of presupposing that as the model of reason. And the other side of this is to see in terms of what I said about Thomas, and a lot of it goes back to Augustine as well, and that is, it's not just that, as Pascal would have it, there's other forms of reason, but what they recognized is there's at least initially an awful lot of faith um, presupposed to any sort of learning, even scientific discourse. Yeah. That's why I mentioned the physicists, right? I was a physics major. Well, I'm not going to have any progress in learning physics if I don't actually um, have faith in those teachers. They can be better teachers or worse teachers and so on. But if I, have, if I go in there saying, I'm going to treat everything you say as false until I myself can show it to be true, well, I will flunk out of physics pretty quickly. <laughs> Right? And then, of course, the marvelous example of the most important thing you know in your life, practically speaking, until maybe you get married or choose a religious life or whatever form of life you choose, is who's my father? Right? Um, because who my father is determines my whole sense of self. Right? And the great thing about that is who my, who knowing who my father is depends upon that woman. Right? The basis for the knowing myself and all these other things about myself, who my brothers are, where I came from, is my mother, ultimately not my father, but my mother, mm. because she reveals it. Like uh, Michael Jackson says in uh, Billie Jean, she says, I'm the one, but I tell you, he isn't, the boy is not my son. Right? Well, she said so. And that's how you know about yourself. So faith is everywhere. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I want to kind of take that one more step, especially uh, kind of going down the road of empiricism and kind of the modern conceptions of rationality as being very kind of confined into the empirical, the measurable. Um, a question that we had come up from Matthew, who's a doc student in, in chemistry, says, okay, I encounter a great number of peers who have little sympathy either for religious faith or people of faith. So as to kind of through the lens of Aquinas, in what way can the faithful demonstrate the ethos of faith for, for these people that kind of come in with kind of a, a presupposed suspicion to, to faith? Yeah, so um, um, I, I actually understand that um, difficulty quite well because um, before I went back to study philosophy, I was very much in sort of realms of learning that were scientifically based and so on. And 
Um, I don't think it's true that all scientists are atheists. In fact, um, there's an awful lot who aren't. But you certainly get that picture, both in terms of personal encounters and a kind of cultural um, picture, right? That there's scientific thinking, and they're the smart ones. And then the people of faith are the are the less smart ones or mm. completely unintelligent. So I, I understand where you're coming from. And I, my approach to these sorts of things is there's really nothing you can say to them, right? At least initially, there's nothing you can say to them initially because they're not going to listen, right? But fortunately, being scientifically minded, um, if they're at least open to reality, which they're supposed to be, they'll observe something in you and try to understand it. And so what I tend to do is say, before you try to convert somebody or to correct them, even if you're not trying to convert them, they won't listen to the correction. You can tell them as much as you like that that's not what Christianity is about, right? Or that's not what religious belief is about. What you have to do is you have to manifest it. And, and, and I think sometimes our problem is that we think of Christianity and religious belief as primarily a system of belief. And then the actions are kind of like, you know, they go along with it. No, the belief is supposed to be the form of the action, the way we live. And so I think the first thing you got to do is you have to manifest. I mean, the, part of the point of being made to the image and likeness of God is that what we understand about that in virtue of the incarnation is to be to the image and likeness of God is to be to the image and likeness of Christ. And so we have to be Christ to the people around us. And after a while, they might say to themselves, why is this guy so different? Why is this woman so different? Because we're Christ-like. And that becomes attractive if we really live to it, because the life of Christ is tremendously attractive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It reminds me of a quote of um, uh, one of our faculty fellows, Father John Paul Kimes, who was asked in the context of kind of bioethical disputes, you know, how do you make up ground when you've exhausted every intellectual avenue in, in discourse with someone and you just aren't getting anywhere? He kind of paused once and he said, well, you become their friend. Um, and and it's it's that kind of interpersonal, um, non-intellectual witness that ultimately can move the needle, um, which I, I think is in, indicative of what you, were, and, what you were sharing there. And if I can just add a little to that, I mean, what I would say is that you, you, you begin with friendship and it's really important that the friendship not end if they don't come around. Mm. Because, because if it ends, then there's a sense in which I mean, there might be people that you have to separate yourself from for your own good, right? But if a friendship ends because the person doesn't come around, it was never friendship to begin with. It was the appearance. Mm. And the appearance of friendship is never going to um, help someone. It has to be the reality of friendship. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, kind of in, in that vein, our questions are kind of um, threading together here. Uh, kind of a question and comment comes in um, to, Aquinas is most commonly associated with his immense contributions to the Catholic intellectual tradition. That's to say, like his contributions are most readily associated as intellectual. Um, but at the same time, he is, after all, St. Thomas Aquinas. And you don't become a saint simply on the merit of your intellect. Um, so what should people know about Aquinas's person that extends beyond his, say, philosophical and theological contributions to the church and gives further substance to his being canonized a saint? Yeah, um, I think uh, that's a good question because that's certainly, and again, a lot of that has to do with the way we think of intellectual life, right? We do have to recognize that, again, against the background of that initial thing I said about Justin Martyr, uh, prior to the modern period, um, philosophy was thought to be a way of life, a disciplined way of life and practices and virtues and so on and that the intellectual was in service to living a certain way, which leads to our um, beatitude. So in that sense, we, we do definitely want to be careful that we don't think of Thomas as kind of working out a system, and then he goes home and then he's holy, right? Um, and, and I think this is really important for all of us, no matter what we're doing with the chemist, um, whatever you're doing, um, that's a way of being holy. Right? You're living out your vocation as called to it by God, given the talents that he gave you. 
and 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 doing that is a way of being holy. Now, in terms of certain virtues that he had, um, one of the uh, major ones was humility. Right, um, he was always turning down preference. Right, never wanting to sort of advance. Now, that doesn't mean if you you should not try to advance in your profession, in your career, in whatever. But you should do it honestly. Are you called to this? And what I mean by sort of preference was being offered to be made a bishop and a cardinal. And he said, no, right? <laughs> no, this is what I am good at. This is what I do. And, um, and, and he was known to be very um, um, humble uh, and so on. And then also seeing everything through the eyes of charity, right? I mean, charity is the thing that abides. And I'm, I'll, I'll give you an example of where the holiness comes out in the intellectual, when I was studying for comprehensive exams as a graduate student, I was reading an awful lot of Aquinas. And I was reading about whether or not there would be hierarchies in heaven of the blessed. And counter to our nice democratic spirit, Thomas argues, yes, there will be. But if you find that surprising, just think of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Um, that's all about hierarchy, right? And it's a hierarchy of the union of God with the intellect which is beatitude. So there, oh my gosh, there's Thomas Aquinas's intellectualism. And I'm feeling pretty good about myself because I'm studying Thomas Aquinas and I'm, I'm learning. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm way up there, you know, and so on, which of course turns out to be kind of Pelagian, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and then in response to an objection, when he's made that point, he then says, but the hierarchy in heaven, which will be a knowing, will be established insofar as one has charity in this life. And immediately from the heights of my hubris, I fell crushed by the weight of my pride, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, Mother Teresa, she's way the hell up there, <laughs> and I'll be lucky if I get in. But it was like the voice of a saint mm -hmm. in the text. It was a text of Aquinas, and it was like, this voice or this hand stretched out of the text and shook me mm. with the insight that characterizes a kind of holiness. So even in the intellectual stuff, you can see the holiness come through. Mm. When he says um, what he says about divine mercy, I mean, you read that stuff and you think, this is a man who's living this holy life. Um, he says very surprisingly, and this drives people crazy, that objection about um, mercy being shown in all of the divine acts. Another objection is, well, that can't be the case because mercy mitigates justice in punishment and um, the damned um, in hell are punished justly. And so mercy would violate that justice. And Thomas says, he says, nope, mercy is shown even in hell because the damned are not punished as much as they deserve. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself again, okay, well, if I go to hell, at least I got that little bit going for me. But again, it's, I mean, I joke a lot, but, but, you know, part of living the holy life he did was outside of this kind of stuff. There's not a lot of, you know, great deeds because the great deed was to communicate to us and the church. Right. And, and so in fact, in his canonization, there was a lot of emphasis upon he's being canonized for the holiness of his work. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, and his commitment to that as communicating a way of life. The Summa, which is the great work is all about where did we come from? Where are we supposed to be going and how do we get there? It's a practical guide as well as an intellectual guide. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really helpful. And actually baked into your, um, answer there, you answered um, two questions that were out there. So um, Mary Benz, I, I think that answers your question about the relationship of mercy and justice. Um, and if it doesn't, we can certainly follow up. I think we have time for one more question. Um, just want to be respectful of people's times this evening, particularly. Um, well, actually, no, we'll, we'll do two. One is very quick and it's anecdotal. Someone asks, uh, do you have any opinions on the podcast Pints with Aquinas? Is it an approachable resource to recommend to those looking to venture into Thomistic kind of thought? I don't know if you are familiar with that. Or not. I'm utterly embarrassed um, um, right now because I'm not familiar with it. 
Um, nice. And now I feel like I will have to become familiar with it. Although as a bourbon drinker, I'd be more likely to say shots with a coin. There you go. Um, Absolutely. Right. But, but I do like a pint here and there, but, but I'm not actually familiar with it. I'll have to look that up. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. And then um, one more question from, from Joseph, who's a, who's a law student here. Um, he said, you said that metaphors say something literal for Thomas. Does Thomas in your reading make a distinction between metaphor and analogy? Yes, um, but it's not what we typically would do. We would tend to think of an analogy as a kind of metaphor. Mm -hmm. For him, a metaphor is taken from a kind of material image of something where in applying the metaphor, it communicates some truth, but you can't really get rid of the materiality of the image. Okay? Um, whereas an analogy is a term that is applied to us, say wisdom or knowledge or justice, where it's applied to material beings like us, but the meaning of it doesn't necessarily involve the materiality. Mm. And so it can be applied to God without the image. Um, but also when it's applied to God, it applies to something in God that is not the very same thing in us. Mm. Um, a metaphor that would communicate truth just to get this right is um, we destroyed Michigan last Saturday Right? Suppose we had played Michigan last Saturday. Well, we crushed them, right? Well, you're just wrong for telling me that that's not literally true, right? It's certainly not spiritually true, right? I mean, we crushed them. I'm telling you something about the reality that can't really be communicated if I say, well, we beat Michigan 45 to 3. No, you're missing something unless I say we crushed them. But there's not a lot of flattened human beings on the field, right? So metaphor does communicate truth. Um, if you say God is a lion, or the one I like in scripture is God is a rock, and you say, well, that's not literally true. No, I, I like to imagine God saying when you get to heaven, by the way, I'm a rock. And you say, no, no, God. I mean, I'm a philosopher. I know you know, you're wise, you're steadfast, you know, but you're not a rock. I mean, that's not literally true. It's spiritually true. And God's saying, I'm a rock. Now get used to it. <laughs> um, we need to listen to the way, the way God speaks to us, is Thomas's point, in especially emphasizing the most appropriate language of revelation is metaphor, not analogy. Analogy is for philosophers. Metaphor is for salvation. Mm -hmm. um, can I say something, though, to Mary on the question of justice and mercy? Yeah, absolutely. Please. One note, O'Callaghan coming out here. <laughs> um, one thing about that objection I mentioned um, is there's a kind of classical notion of mercy, which you get from uh, the Romans, especially. And it's a very judicial notion. Right. And that's certainly included a little bit in Aquinas's discussion of misericordia. But misericordia is much broader. And the judicial notion you get from the Romans is that, well, you have a just punishment and then mercy might lessen the punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Thomas turns that around and he says, in fact, justice is aiming at mercy and mercy surpasses justice. So justice, do or mercy mm -hmm. doesn't limit justice. And so in contemporary philosophy, when you get a discussion of mercy, it's all about whether or not we should be merciful because it looks like mercy violates justice, right? Which was the objection Thomas was doing, right? Um, but Thomas is operating with a very different sense of it. And that is mercy is an expression of friendship. And that's why mercy surpasses justice and justice aims at mercy. Hmm. Mercy doesn't limit justice or violate it. Justice is aiming at mercy. And that's the way Thomas thinks of it. It's a kind of reversal of the classical notion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's even helpful for me personally. Thank you. Um, and I think on, on the spirit of um, one note, O'Callaghan, that's a great one note to end on. Um, so friends, thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Um, blessings for the rest of the week. And Professor O'Callaghan, thank you so much for all that you do for this center and the Shockmere Tan Center and our philosophy department um, and look forward to catching up with you sometime soon. I want my $2. You got it. It's coming, coming. You got it. Have a good night, everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks for coming.